So I mentioned that we will plan to, to look at it by looking individually at, first of all, fluid flow problems. We don't need to recap FEM because we just talked about it. Uh, we don't need to look at COMSOL because we've kind of uh, talked about that as well. But let's look at the, the very simplest element that we might have. So rather than looking at a two-dimensional system, which we looked at briefly uh, right now, we could look at the, the simplest system, which would just be a one-dimensional uh, linear system that we could deal with. And the, the approach that we'll take in all of this class is kind of embodied in this system of, of matrices. And so each one of these um, locations is a submatrix that operates on a property and relates to a flux of some kind. And so if we're talking about the system that we're dealing with, we talked about this behavior of thermal, hydromechanical, chemical behavior, then when we, what we're going to attempt to do is we will divide our system up into, ultimately, uh, elements that fill 2D, but for now we'll work on elements that only fill one dimension. And these elements would represent something physical, like, say, a bar, or a tube, or a core, for instance. And at each of the ends, at, at the nodes that represent the ends of these elements, they would have some dependent variables. And so those would be the variables that we solve for. So if we're solving for mechanical problems, then the variables that we deal with are displacements and displacement rates, velocities. If we're dealing with fluid flow problems, then the, displace, the variables we deal with are either fluid pressures or heads. If we're dealing with thermal problems, then the, the nodal variables are temperatures. And if we're dealing with mass transport problems, then the nodal variables that we're dealing with are, are concentrations. And so what we'll find out how to do is be able to put together the appropriate matrices, not only that allow us to link the values that exist on the leading diagonal of this with these values that exist in this um, vector, and the values that exist on this leading diagonal here, and the values that exist within this vector, which would be the uncoupled systems. So those would be the systems that are completely independent of each other. But if we want, for instance, fluid pressures to influence deformations in the mechanical system, then we have to find some way of linking the behaviors in, of pressures with displacements. And so rather than just having the terms on the leading diagonal, we'll also want to know what these cross-coupling terms are. So this is a convenient way for us to, to think about it. We do it a little bit differently from this, but uh, it's a convenient conceptualization. And so if we are now talking about the first of our systems in terms of uh, fluid flow and the diffusion of pressure, just a it's really fluid flow, it's just kind of a more complicated way of writing it that we don't really need, I, I think, um, then we need to figure out exactly what the the behavior is that we need to solve. And this is maybe the simplest way of, of, of looking at this. Because So if we're looking at the, the dependent variables that we apply at these nodes, then if we have displacements, then displacements have both magnitude and direction. So they'd have a displacement in the x direction, and they'd have a displacement in the y direction. So these variables here are not scalar, they're actually vectoral quantities. They have both magnitude and direction. One reason to talk about fluid behavior first is pressures are just a scalar quantity. Pressure is applied at a point. Head is applied at a point. It has a value. It has no direction. And so the nodal degrees of freedom that we have of this, if it was a fluid flow problem, would just either be pressure at this node or it would be head at this node, whichever we define this behavior in terms of. And so that's why fluid, behave, uh, fluid flow is perhaps the easiest one to, to deal with. And so what we'll find out is that what we'd like to do is we'd like to have a relationship that links fluid pressure or head with a fluid velocity or flux. Just as we know that Darcy's law is given by um, permeability 
divided by viscosity and a pressure gradient. A velocity or a flux is linked to a gradient of pressure. A pressure is linked to a flux. So what we want to know is what the, the term is that links those together. And that's really our, our goal in this. And then once we've done that for the steady state, we can also look at how that would affect uh, transient behavior, but we'll leave that for a, a different time. And so um, yeah, you probably know what Darcy's law is. Um, you, we can write it in a variety of ways, but let's not worry about this. Um, but let's also put this in perspective in terms of the, uh, the other thing that we talked about uh, when we introduced finite element methods. And that was that we said it didn't really matter whether we're solving a 1D or a 2D or a 3D problem or a transient problem. We use the same code. Uh, and the one thing that I didn't really say, but I guess I alluded to, is that if you want to solve a solid mechanics problem or a fluid flow problem or a heat transfer problem, we can do it all inside this ComSol program. Why is that? Why, did, why does it look the same? And the reason is that when we solve any um, boundary value problem, just like the heat flow problem that we had on the, on the, on the screen, is we satisfy four, for, whether it's solid mechanics or fluid flow or, or mass transport, we satisfy the same four requirements in solving the system. And those are written out here. The flow system we'll deal with is that we solve conservation of mass. The conservation of mass just says that the, the mass rate of fluid into the system has into a cube has to equal the mass rate of flow out of the system. Uh, and anything that doesn't satisfy that balance is a net accumulation. So that's what the mass balance statement is. It has to satisfy continuity. And continuity just requires that the heads or pressures are continuous. They don't have jumps in them. Uh, in other words, they must be smooth, and we can enforce that. They have to satisfy, the third condition is they have to satisfy a constitutive relationship. And our constitutive relationship is Darcy's law. And the, the constitutive relationship just says a gradient of some quantity, in our case, does something. So a gradient in pressure or a gradient in head drives flow at some velocity. And the parameter that controls the rate of that flow, the scaling parameter, is just the permeability divided by the viscosity. Or some of you might be more used to looking at this in terms of a head, which would be hydraulic conductivity times change in head with length. Same thing, a gradient of some quantity. That's the third requirement. And we have to satisfy boundary conditions. And if it's a transient problem, initial conditions. So those are the four requirements. These are both fours in my, my estimation. So that's for fluid flow. For fluid transport, in terms of mass, it's exactly the same. The, the mass of a chemical species into the system versus the mass out has to be equal unless you get net accumulation. That's conservation law. The distributions of mass concentration have to be continuous, no jumps. The constitutive laws are fixed law, which says that the mass flow rate is equal to the diffusion coefficient multiplied by DCDX, concentration gradient, and initial conditions and boundary conditions. So fluid flow, Darcy's law, mass transport, fixed law, but also advection, which we won't talk about yet, and heat transport, which is uh, Fourier's law. Heat, heat, the rate of heat transport is proportional to or equal to thermal conductivity times dt dx. They all follow exactly the same behavior. They're all linking a constituent relationship, a conservation equation. We don't really care too much about continuity. That's already taken care of in some way. But these, these two, one and three, are the most important components. And so also, and we'll come back to this, for solid mechanics, it's exactly the same thing. Um, the conservation equation is conservation of momentum, which we can write in a variety of different ways. We use virtual work, but let's not worry about that now. So we conserve momentum, which is really Newton's law, F equals ma. Uh, we make sure that displacements are continuous, that there's no jumps in displacements. Uh, 
and we use a constitutive law. And that is that strains are related to stresses through an elasticity matrix, bless you. And if we want to write this out in longhand, we also know that we could write this out as um, kind of like this. Right? We've made the point that these constitutive relationships for Darcy's law link a fluid flow velocity with a pressure gradient. For solid mechanics, constitutive law, Hooke's law, links um, stresses to modulus through a displacement gradient. And we call these displacement gradient strains. So they're, they're very similar. Solid mechanics is more complicated, as we made the point before, because displacements and strains are tensoral properties, vectoral properties, not just magnitude, but direction. Fluid flow driven by pressures, Temperature, heat flow driven by, fluid flow driven by pressures, heat flow driven by temperatures, and mass transport driven by concentrations are all, temperature, concentration, and pressures are all scalar quantities. And so they just have one value at the nodes. So that's why it's easiest for us to attack that one first. But we'll come back to this figure because it's important because it kind of puts it in the right perspective, I think, in terms of what we're attempting to do. Uh, we've made the case about... Um, conservation equations, and this is kind of a, a restatement of that. We take a differential cube, we look at flow in from one side, flow out of the other side, and we attempt to balance it. Um, the flow could be of a fluid where the density changes as it goes across the system, but uh, we won't deal with that case. And so if you look at in the flowing in the x direction, which is this one here, then this is the simple... Um, conservation equation. The area of the face that it goes in over, which would be this area here, multiplied by the density times the flow rate in on the back side, minus the amount that comes out, which is the flow rate in plus the change in that flow rate as it goes across the, the system. Um, jim, 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 jim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we don't need to change that. Has to equal the mass that accumulates. This is the mass that accumulates. So this is a mass flow rate, a density times, this also has to be an A here, I guess. This is a density and a velocity times an area. So a velocity is a length over time, an area is length squared, so it's length cubed over time. Length cubed times kilograms per meter cubed is kilograms per unit time. So each one of these uh, is in terms of uh, a mass rate, kilograms per time. If you subtract these from each other, this cancels with this, and we're left only with this. This is done just for one, dimen one direction. So if you then do it for the, the y direction, and if you then do it for the z direction, then you get three terms like this which is exactly this term that's on the bottom, this. If you look at what the mass accumulation rate is, we won't go into this, it's just going to be equal to a parameter, specific storage, uh, multiplied by a change in head. So we'll do our calculations in heads rather than pressures, even though it's actually much more useful when you look at coupling mechanical behavior with fluid behavior to use pressures because Pressures define effective stresses, and those are the, the coupling term that you need, but you, it's a simple um, transformation. And so this is the conservation equation, if you like, for looking at this, this behavior. We can take the density out of it and remove it from both sides, and we almost have an equation we can work with, except the left-hand side basically says that mass in minus mass out. That's really what this says. So mass in minus mass out equals accumulation. So if there's more that comes in than goes out, then you net accumulate some. And so this term would be, be finite. And so the only other thing we need to do is we need to try and define this equation in terms of only one variable. It could be velocity or it's more conveniently head. And so the way for us to be able to define that is to close the set of equations with a constitutive law, 
and the constitutive law is that velocity in the x-direction is equal to hydraulic conductivity times the gradient of head in the x-direction. And likewise, velocity in the y-direction is equal to the hydraulic conductivity times the gradient of head in the y-direction. And likewise for the z, I guess I might as well write it out. Um, we might put a minus sign here because velocity is a vector quantity. And so if you look at a piece of core that has a head defined on it relative to the x direction, and if the head changes from the upstream magnitude of this to the downstream magnitude of this, this gradient is negative. Minus VE is my way of saying negative. You said a lot. And so this is a negative gradient, but it gives a velocity in the positive x direction. So if this gradient is negative, this is always positive. So a negative times a negative gives you a velocity which is positive in the x direction. So it's a negative sign. And so the reason for doing this is that now we can actually put this into here. And we can put this into here. And we can put this into here. I know I'm making a bit of a mess, but hey, it's my notes. I can scribble on if I want. And if we do that, I think somewhere down here, we end up having done that with exactly that expression. And we can simplify it. Often you see this written as, for instance, hydraulic conductivity in the x direction times d2h dx squared plus hydraulic conductivity in the y direction times d2h dy squared plus hydraulic conductivity in the z direction. Yeah, you guessed it. Is equal to specific storage multiplied by the change in head with time. So these are in space and this is in time. And so that's the, the governing PDE partial differential equation that describes this, this behavior. And so it comes from making this relationship of mass rate in equals mass rate out. If it doesn't equal that, then there's some net accumulation. And that's what these terms are. This is mass rate in equals mass rate out on the left-hand side. And this is accumulation. And this is... And so that's an important step, because that's exactly the same expression that we would use for heat flow. Heat flow follows the same deal. You take conservation equation, mass rate in equals, sorry, heat rate in equals heat rate out. If there's an imbalance, then there's a net accumulation of heat. Um, and we do exactly the same. So we have a heat rate term on the left-hand side. We have an accumulation term on the right-hand side, just as you have here. And the left-hand side term, the, the, the heat rate in minus the heat rate out, is written in terms of a heat rate. But we use Fourier's law to be able to represent that. So oh, we'll get to that in, in due course. So let's not worry about that. So the one nice thing about um, the one-dimensional uh, formulation for Darcy's law is that actually we can make a, an element to solve for um, fluid transport without any kind of uh, strength from what we have here. Actually, with even less than what we have here. So what we've done is we derive this uh, governing partial differential equation. And we'll need to use that when we talk about two-dimensional problems. Uh, but for one-dimensional problems, actually, we can get away with just using Darcy's law. And so let's do that, because it's a very simple way to explore what's going on. And so this is Darcy's, well, I'm not sure if this was Darcy's experiment, but uh, this could be Darcy's experiment. And the idea is that you have a, a head change that you measure along a sample. That head change is apparent over some length. And if you know what um, that head change is, then you can calculate 
the velocity of the system. And if you multiply the velocity by an area, then this becomes a volumetric flow rate, which is meters cubed per second in terms of units. So that's just Darcy's law. And this is how you, you measure it. So it's the magnitude of the difference between these values. So this is the change in head. This is the change in length. So you have these two terms here. There's a minus sign in here, but we don't care about it. This is a coefficient, which we'd like to, if we measure, for instance, the flow rate as a function of the prescribed head gradient that we prescribe in the system. So we know this, and we measure this then we can calculate what the hydraulic conductivity is. So that's how the, the experiments run. So what we could do is we could try and use that and try and make it into a final element uh, code to be able to solve for the flow problem. And we can do it very straightforwardly. Uh, and we can do it straightforwardly if we violate a bit of physics uh, in terms of terminology, um, but not too much. But it makes it very simple. So here's the idea. So we take that same geometry that we just had. Um, this is this um, you know, core plug that has a cylindrical shape or whatever shape, it doesn't really matter. It has some length to it. It has an upstream portion and a downstream portion. And at these two locations, there are two variables that we describe at each of the nodes. So we're going to represent this tube as an element. Oops. Okay, it doesn't like that. And this element has ends to it. Uh, I guess we've, we've alluded to that here. This is node number one. This is node number two. And uh, at each of these locations, we realize that Darcy's law links a value of a volumetric flow rate with a magnitude of the heads. And so what we're going to do is at each of these elements, we're going to define these two variables, the head at node 1 and the flow rate at node 1. And we're going to define the head at node 2 and the flow rate at node 2. And those are exactly as we've shown here. So this is the head value, and this is the, the volumetric flow rate. The characteristics of this element are that it has some length, L1. It has some cross-sectional area, which is the area of this circle, which is A, and it has some magnitude of hydraulic conductivity. So those are the things that fill out this equation. It has a nodal value of flow rate at one location, the element has a cross-sectional area, it has a hydraulic conductivity attached to it, which is uniform, for that one element, and it has values of heads at the top and bottom and the, and the length. And so what we could do is we could write Darcy's law, which is exactly the same as we had before. It's area times hydraulic conductivity times change in head with length. And look at what these values are. Well, the area is definitely A1, but it's going to be the same area wherever we are because it doesn't change along its length, just to make life easy for us. The conductivity is going to be K1. The change in head as we go from upstream to downstream is h2 minus h1. This is just dh. And the length over which it occurs is just the longitudinal length of the, of the element. And so if we write that out, then we have an expression that defines the flow rate if we know what the values of these heads are. We don't know, but we figure that out. So uh, is that right in its current form? It's, I think it's not right because it doesn't have the minus sign in it. But let's not worry about that. It's just a, a sign-off. And so what else do we know? We know that if this is steady state, then the amount of fluid that comes out of here has to be exactly replaced by the amount going in. And, uh, and so we can put an extra constraint on this. But of course, fluid flow is a vectoral quantity, as we said before, right? Velocity times area is fluid flow. And velocity has both magnitude and direction. So within this element, at the top part, Q1 has magnitude and direction. Q2 also has magnitude and direction. And they must be the same. So Q1 and Q2 
should be the same and of the same sign. But let's circumvent physics for a while, and let's, instead of defining flow rate as a vector quantity, let's define it as a scalar. So it's scalar, it's plus if it's coming out of the element, and it's negative if it's going into the element. And so that's really what we're doing here. So we're violating a little bit of physics just by tricking it, by saying Q is actually a scalar, not a vector quantity. If it's positive, then it's going into the element, or neg negative, it's going out. Either way, it doesn't really matter what the convention is. And so what we could do is we can now write Q2 as being the negative of this. And so if we do that, uh, then we end up with what? Uh, let me write at the bottom. No, let me just write here. So what would it be? Q2 is equal to minus A1. Now that's, um, yeah, that's minus A1, K1, H2 minus H1 over L. And so now what we could do is we have two equations, and we could write them in this, this form. We could write them as a, a vector multiplied by a matrix times a vector. A vector is equal to a matrix times a vector. And so all I want to do now is to take this equation here and to put it in this. So Q1 is equal to AK over L, AK over L, and I want um, uh, H2 minus H1, but I actually have H1 minus H2, so I can put a negative sign here to take care of that, right? So this value here is equal to this times this component multiplied by this, if you remember your matrix multiplication. Um, and I want, now want to put this one in. So Q2 goes in here, and it's equal to the negative of this. And you can check it out. Again, if you write this out, this has a negative sign. So it's just going to be actually the negative, the opposite of these two. Instead of this being plus 1, this is minus 1. Instead of this being minus 1, this is plus 1. And so that actually turns out to be the conductance element for a single element, one-dimensional element, for finite element flow. So it's useful that we can get it in about three steps. It really didn't take very long to get there. Uh, we just had to bend a bit of physics to do it. And now this is the basic building block that we'll use to solve these problems. So we didn't really show you the mesh when we talked about the, um, uh, the problem with the, the COMSOL model with the hole in it. But there was an underlying mesh that did it. And so the interesting thing about finite element methods is it's not very interesting to solve for a single element, but you want to put a whole bunch of them together. And so to do that, what we could do is now, once we have this fundamental building block of what we want, which is this, which, by the way, we'll always write out that flow rate is equal to a conductance matrix multiplied by a vector of heads. We can do this where there are just two nodes within the element, as there was in this particular case. Or we could also start putting these elements together to be able to make a much more complex system and then solve that. And so that's our task now, is to be able to use this building block to be able to do basically that. So let's solve a very simple, very simple problem. And this is the, the simple problem that we'll attempt to do. I guess I should, I'm going to make that full screen just because I can. And so this is a, a dam. And so the dam has an upstream water level. I understand we're waiting for rain in Daejeon. It doesn't look like it's... A, because there's a drought on. It doesn't look like it's going to rain today. Of course, it won't rain today because we're stuck in here. It'll rain tomorrow. It'll rain on uh, Friday when you're not in here. <laughs> uh, and this is with an impermeable cap. And so all the flow is going through this lower portion of the dam. It has two different um, uh, hydraulic conductivities to it, one which is higher upstream and one which is uh, lower downstream. I have not units on it, but it would be meters per second. It has a height of this. It has a length into the page of some magnitude. Let's call it one. And let's um, idealize this as a, a two-element system. This is element number one, which we just kind of drew, which represents this block here. And this is element number two, which represents the upstream block. And so what we'd like to be able to do is we realize that the conductance matrix that we have is always given by this equation, Q1, Q2, is equal to the area 
of the end of the element, the hydraulic conductivity, and the length of the element, multiplied by 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1, and multiplied by the heads at nodes 1 and nodes 2. And so we could use that to represent this behavior. Here we have, if we take this element and we put it here, then we have node 1 and node 2. But we could also use it to represent this element here. And again, we could use this idea of local node 1 and local node 2. Right? Because it's just the same geometry that we're using in this. And so this is the kind of uh, template that we'll use. We'll put the template down here to be able to represent this. Uh, and it has upstream 1, 2 from left to right. And we'll then use the same template on the upper part again. And it has to conform to this behavior. And so what we can do is we can now start solving a system of equations, very straightforwardly, that use that template. And so to do that, we need to have this idea of, of local node numbers. These are local node numbers. And we can also think of global node numbers. In other words, numbers that don't repeat themselves. They're unique. Node 1, node 2, node 3. If it was a system like this, it would be uh, node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4, etc. So that's, that's what we're going to do. And so if we use that numbering system, uh, we, right now we can use it for nodes. Uh, it turns out that what we know we're going to do, right, we, we said that at each one of these nodes we have a value of the head at node 1 and the value of the flow rate at node 1. And so another reason to, to do the flow problem is that we only have one degree of freedom, one variable per node, it's a scalar value per node. We don't have multiple displacements. And so it turns out that we talk in terms of, we'll use this term degrees of freedom. There's one degree of freedom at this point. There's one value only, and it's a scalar value. When we talk about displacements for two-dimensional elements, we'll have two degrees of freedom, and it just gets more complicated. But the, the, the rationale that we, uh, or the system that we use to, to build the matrices for this will be exactly the same. And so we can think in terms of this. I guess it's written out here. This is the global mesh, which in includes both of these elements, uniquely numbered for the nodes. This is the local mesh, which we first put down over here for this one, and then, then we put down over here. And so what we can do is we could try uh, writing a system of equations. And uh, I don't know if I can get both of these, can't get them both on at the same time. So maybe leave it like this. So what we're going to do is we could write a conductance matrix for this element. Right? We'll call it element number one, which is this. And we could write the conductance matrix for this. It'll look just like this, where we use the appropriate values of area, which will be the same, always 10 meters times one. So area will always be equal to 10 times 1 meter squared. Hydraulic conductivity for element number 1 will be equal to 10 to the minus 6 meters per second. And the length for element 1 is going to be 10 meters. Uh, the, the areas will be the same. For element number 2, this is going to be different, Roman 2, this is going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 6, again meters per second, I just don't have space to write it, I should write it. And so if we know what these values are, then surely we can put this matrix together with these terms. And so what we'll do is we'll write not a local matrix, but we'll write a global matrix. That's good handwriting. Okay. And don't think about the terms that are in there yet, but just let's talk about what we want is this vector of flow rates. We have three degrees of freedom in our system, right? Three terms flow rates at nodes 1, nodes 2, and nodes 3. 
And so we'll put those together in here to be able to represent that. Q1, Q2, Q3. We've got that. Nothing else is there. Ignore everything else. We have a vector of heads. We have a head at node 1, head at node 2, and a head at node 3 that define our system. We may know them or we may not know them. We'll talk about that a bit later. And that we know that to link uh, a vector with three components in it to a vector with three components in it, we need a matrix which has um, 3 by 3 in size. Right? So ignore the fact that this exists with terms in it. But maybe, well, why don't we, you know, why don't I just do that? Do that. I'm just going to repeat the same relationship as here, but it's perhaps instructive to be able to just draw it out. I know exactly what I'm going to fill it with. And so this vector is H1, H2, H3. And all I'm doing is making the point that if this is, has three components in it, and it links with three components, then this needs to be a 3x3 three three matrix. We don't know what the terms are. What we can then do is start populating this. We know that Q1 and Q2 are linked to each other. So Q1 and Q2 are linked to each other in terms of this uh, conductance matrix. And so what we could do is we can start filling the terms in that link global nodes H1 and H2. And so those must exist. They link um, Q1 and Q2 with H1 and H2. So they must go in these locations. They're outlined in the box. We know this multiplier outside is equal to uh, AK over L, which is 10 to the 6, minus 6, right? So this is just area times conductivity over length. And we're just using 10 to the 6 as the conductivity. It's twice the magnitude for the upstream value. And so the values that go in here would be 1, minus 1, minus 1, in other words, we're just using this, this template, this basically this template here. Because this links H1 and H2 with Q1 and Q2. Likewise, for this other component, we have Q2 and Q3 linked together with H2 and H3. And so what we want to do is be able to take the matrix that represents those, which is this. And this, of course, will link the magnitude of head at this location, which would be H2 and H3, with the values of Q2 and Q3. So this one clearly is going to go in this location. It should have different colors. It links H2 and H3, head at node 2 to the head at node 3, with the flow rate at node 2 and the flow rate at node 3. And so, individually, these go in. This is 2 times 10 to the minus 6, not 1 times 10 to the 6. So we just add those components in. 2, minus 2, minus 2, 2. And you'll see that this, this uh, relationship here is just the same as this. No different. Just perhaps it was useful to be able to do it that way. These added terms together create this, and we have a system. So that's now the system matrix that describes this particular geometry that we have here that we're going to try and solve. So then the next question is, what do we know? What do we know in the system? Well, clearly we know what the head is at this portion. It's equal to the elevation of this part. This would be the elevation head, Z1. And this would be the pressure head at any point. Bless you, P1 over gamma W. So it just says that the, the head at this point has to be uh, 20 meters. So this is H1. Likewise, at this upstream point, it doesn't matter where we draw this, whether we draw it here or here. Again, this is equal to 25. 
which is H2, sorry, H3. So we know H3, we know H1, we don't know what H2 is. Um, and there would be a flow rate that goes in here, and this would be Q3. I don't think we know that. And this would be Q1. I don't think we know that. And so these are the conditions that we have uh, upstream and downstream. So let's think about how that relates to our system. So what do we know? We know that the head at node 1 is equal to 20 meters. We know the head at node 3 is equal to 25. We don't know what H2 is. That's something we're going to solve for. Um, we don't know what the flow rates are at Q1 going into the dam. We don't know what the flow rate, uh, I guess, coming out of the dam, probably. Q1 is coming out of the dam. We don't know what the flow rate going into the dam is. But if it's steady state, then Q1 and Q3 have to be the same as each other, uh, actually opposite of each other inverse of each other. So I guess we also know that steady state that Q1 equals minus Q3, but we, we're not going to use that. But we do know something about Q2. What we do know is that the amount of flow that comes out of element um, 2, oh, I guess 2, let's get rid of that. Right? The amount of flow that comes out of element 2 and goes into element 3 has to be the same that goes into element 3 from element 2. And since we define the Qs as the opposite of each other for inflow and outflow, then we know that there's no net flux at this location. So Q2 is equal to 0. So that's the one thing that we, we do know. And so if we look at this system of equations, we know a head at node 1, we know a head at node 3, and we know a flux at the intermediate in, internal node. And actually, if we had 50 internal nodes, the fluxes would all, all 50 of those internal nodes would also be the same, because the same amount is coming out of one element as is going in another element, so there's no net accumulation of that node. And so now we have enough to be able to solve this. So in other words, if we put this equal to zero, then the reason for these two bars is, is that we only have one significant, whoops, we only have one significant equation here, and that's this middle equation. And if we write this middle equation out in longhand, what is it? Uh, let me write it out. It's Q2, which is equal to 0, is equal to 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by this. Minus, uh, bless you, minus H1 uh, plus 3H2 minus 2h3, I guess I could put a 1 there as well, just for consistency. We know that this is equal to 20. We know that this is equal to 25. We don't know what this is. So we have one equation, one unknown, we know everything. And so by rearranging that and solving it, uh, if we do it, it turns out that the value of head at node 2 is equal to 70 over 3, or that is um, 23.33, right? Is that right? Meters. And so if we know the value of this, we could do, if we wanted to now, we could resubstitute this back into here. So we know this is 20, we know this is 25, and um, we know this is 23.3, or 70 over 3. So now if we know all three of these, we could calculate, for instance, the value of Q1, which is going to be equal to 20 times 1 minus 23.33 times 1, all times 10 to the minus 6, which is this expression at the bottom. And so just by using this now, resubstituting and using this top equation here, which we didn't use before, and which gives us this. And resubstituting and using this bottom equation here, 
which gives us this. We have all, all the components of our solution. And so now all we need to do is figure out whether it makes sense to us. Um, so if you work out what this magnitude is, we said before that Q1 has to equal minus Q2 by definition. And so it turns out that it does. So that's reassuring. That makes sense. We don't know whether it's the right amount, but at least we know it, that the mass in, the volume, the flow rate in is equal to the flow rate out. And so that's at least one requirement that it does satisfy. And then I suppose we could ask ourselves whether this value of 23.33 actually makes sense or not. Um, and I guess we could use a, another code to be able to calculate it. But I think we can probably just suggest it based on... Um, oh, I'm looking for something else now. What am I looking for? Uh, I'm looking for blank master. So... I have a system here, as you will see. As you see. I can't do that. Uh, I guess I need to open it with something else. Okay. All right. So does it make sense? Let's ask ourselves whether it makes sense or not. We could also calculate it in a different way, but let's just ask ourselves if it makes sense. Where are we? So this is the geometry we have, right? So we have, basically we have a system with these two components. If we were, for instance, to be able to draw, yeah, I suppose I should, might have put some blank pages in the notes so you could draw this, but if this is the behavior that we have, so we know that this is equal to 20. We know that this is equal to 25. And we know that if this if both of these materials were the same, which they aren't, but if they were the same, then Darcy's law would just tell us that the the gradient across them has to be uniform. Uh, why is that so? Because the velocity has to equal dh dx. So if uh, the velocity is constant as we go across here, then and the hydraulic conductivity is constant as we go across here, then the gradient has to be a single value. And the only one that satisfies a single value is if it's a straight line, right, by definition. So we know that's the case if this is the case if um, I should have drawn this larger. This is the case if k1 is equal to k2, by definition. So how do we use this to be able to figure out what's going on if that's not the case? So in other words, we know that velocity in zone 1 has to equal the hydraulic conductivity of zone 1 times dh dx. And we know that the velocity in zone 2 has to equal the hydraulic conductivity in 2 multiplied by dh dx. We know that if water is flowing from the upstream to the downstream, like uh, cars in traffic, if one car is going faster than the other, there's a net accumulation of cars, and so it's not steady state because they're accumulating. Uh, to be in steady state, the flow rate in has to equal the flow rate out, which means that at any single point that you look at a line that goes across this, the velocity across that line should be the same. So if, for instance, you plotted the velocity across this system, then it has to be this. So it has to be the same in zone 1 as it has to be in zone 2. And so we know that these two have to be the same. These have to be equal to each other. And so if that's the case, then if the hydraulic conductivity is twice as large in one system than the other, then the gradient is going to be half as big. That's the scaling. So if you double, the, if this hydraulic conductivity is twice as large as this one, then the gradient has to be only half as large. 
to drive it at the same velocity. It's just scaling. And so in our particular case, what was it? Uh, which one was big? Uh, it was the upstream that was two times, right? So what does that mean? So this is a uh, high conductivity. So to be able to drive the flow in this one at the same rate as this, we only need half the gradient. And so we know by just that rationale that the gradient needs to be half. So dh dx in 2 is equal to half of dh dx in 1. I think that's right. right. So this has to be much smaller. And so to be able to put that together then, we know that uh, if we look at the heads between this, we know this is, I can do it on a larger scale now, right? We know that this is 20 meters. And we know that this is 25 meters, this point here. And now we want to figure out exactly what's going on between these. It's not going to be a straight line anymore. We've said the head over part 2 is going to be half the head over here. And so the only way we can do that, well, we can take this trial value of 23.3, so what would this be? This would be 22.5 at this point here. So this would be 23.3. And in which case we'd have this. And we'd have this. And so is that the case? So the change in head at uh, location 2 is going to be what? This is 10 meters, roughly is 10 meters. So the head is going to be equal to, uh, what is that? It's um, 1.66, is that right? And the head at location 1 is going to be equal to what? 2.33. So this indeed is twice as large, exactly twice as large. So it makes perfect sense. So we haven't done any really complicated calculations. We just use logic to be able to make the case that this gradient here has to be double this gradient here based on this argument, that the flow rates have to be the same, otherwise you get net accumulation. Um, we could calculate what that gradient would be, but since we know the, that the result should be 23.3 here. We can just use that value to check that that's the case. And it turns out to be the case. That's it. And so that's it. And so the, the interesting thing in this, I, well, I think it's interesting. I'm not sure how you think it is, is that basically now we've, we've, without using any conservation equations, although we have them, we've used Darcy's law only. And we've used that to make the template for a single element that allows us to be able to solve not just for a single flow tube, but for as many that we want to string together uh, as we want. And it's relatively straightforward for us to do that. And so now we're in a position to be able to, to take that and now take it the next step, if we understand what's going on here, and we'll now apply it to two-dimensional problems. Two-dimensional problems are a bit more complicated because we do need the conservation equation that we already derived, which is why we derived it. Uh, we can't get around from using that. And so that's the next thing that we'll, we'll do. So this timing is perfect. <laughs> How good I am. No questions? <laughs>